Hello, Dr. Dyke Drummond here at the home of TheHappyMD.com in beautiful Seattle, Washington. Welcome to the latest episode of the Physicians on Purpose podcast. Tools so you can recognize and prevent your own burnout. Stories of burnout put to its highest and best use and wellness leadership strategies. Everything you need to be a physician on purpose. Hello again, Dr. Dyke Drummond here with the latest edition of the Physicians on Purpose podcast. And this is a special one because we're on part three, the final part of our three-part series on physician suicide. Part one, we talked about the personal first-person experience of recognizing that you're suicidal and surviving it. Part two, we talked about what it's like to be a colleague and how do you reach out to a colleague who might be suicidal. And this part number three, we're going to talk about If you're a coach, if you're coaching physicians, how do you recognize a suicidal client and what do you do in response to that recognition? And I have my all-star crew with me again, Dr. Pam Pappas, Dr. Penelope Shu, both physicians, both ICF certified executive coaches and both members of the coaching team here at thehappymd.com. And um, what we thought that we would do, we were just talking about it before we started the recording, what we thought that we would do is a, a modified case study. So if you're a coach, this is really appropriate for you to listen along and, and see what we do, but also for anybody who's going to do any sort of reach out to anybody who is in distress, you may get into the same kind of conversation that we're going to be in here today. So the tools will work for anybody who finds themselves in a conversation, and I'm just going to start um, when the back, the hairs on the back of your neck go up because of what somebody just told you, right? Are you with me? So to begin today, um, I think, Penny, you're going to start us, right? Dr. Shu's going to start us? Okay, cool. Let's let's do this. Everybody say hi. (laughs) Because ideally, you've been listening to part one and part two. We're going to put these into a a lesson plan here so that people can um, really get a viewpoint on the scourge of physician suicide, what it looks like in real life, a different viewpoint. And we're going layer three here. What do you do in a conversation, especially if you're a coach? Penny, kick us off. Okay. So I had, um, I have a client who reached out to the happy MD, you know, to have a discovery call to get support because they had had a colleague commit suicide, um, in the last month or two. And, um, and just to be, just to be clear, if I can interrupt our work together, when we ask people and we don't always ask this, but when we ask people, do you know anybody who's committed suicide? It's shockingly frequent that doctors will say yes. I think it's something like 50% of doctors know somebody who committed suicide, either in training or in practice. Excuse me. Go ahead. Um, So this, so, so this client, um, again, had gone through the trauma of it and had not felt particularly supported by their institution and knew that they, you know, were, were obviously struggling with it, not just sort of the grief of it, but how do I make sure I don't, you know, um, go down that path? You know, how did I miss this? You, You know, I was a bad coworker, like all of those types of things. And so they reached out to us at the Happy MD for some support. And we started working together, um, doing what we, what I usually do, which is kind of set them up initially with just some, some practical stress management, squeegee breath, like how do you just get through your day and, and then slowly unpacking the grief and things like that. And all of the while their workload and obviously the whole department's workload had gone up because they had lost a provider very suddenly and they had not been able to recruit to replace. So the work burdens just kept going up and this client was in a leadership position and it was just sort of expected that they would take the extra call and, you know, do the extra conference and do the extra lecture. (laughs) So I'm just going to say management made a choice not to bring in an urgent locum tenens. So I just want to, I want to point this out. A piece of the pressure that these people were under could have been alleviated by management's urgent responsible actions so i'm starting to get pissed off but that's not unusual <laughs> so right and 
<laughs> you know, in, in typical Lone Ranger superhero mode, this client was like, okay, you know, I'm the leader. I, I should be able to keep going. I will do this. I will set the model for everybody. And eventually it just got to be too much for them where they started having passive suicidal thoughts themselves about, you know, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to be here anymore. This isn't worth it. You know, I'm not contributing to my family. I'm not contributing. I'm not helping my team. You know, patient care is failing. Like I'm failing here on every count. What am I even doing here? And they had the wherewithal to recognize that they were having those thoughts and they actually, you know, walk themselves into a psychiatric hospital for an inpatient stay. Um, and they wound up there, you know, for quite some time and, and, and then they came out of that and, um, you know, they were like, can we pick back up, you know, and start coaching again? And I, and I have to admit, I was like, I don't know, can we, like, I don't know what the rules are. Um, and that's when I came and, and, and got some advice from all of you and, Essentially, for me as the coach, because I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a therapist, I really, I really, I almost like mandated it, right, that they had to be working with a therapist and a psychiatrist and have regular appointments, like kind of set up already, you know, I didn't want, um, I just didn't want to be the only person supporting this person, not just like medical liability wise, but just like, I feel like it I felt at the moment that it was beyond what I had been trained to do as a coach. Um, and so that leads to the question of like, right, what is the role of a coach in the face of that? <laughs> Pace coordinator, I would say, because uh, I've done the same thing. If I have, if I have a suspicion that somebody's depressed, if I have a suspicion that someone is suicidal, I'll help them line up a team that includes a primary care provider, and some sort of mental health provider. Uh, and then the primary care provider, I occasionally will get permission and make a phone call to. And that person is usually what the person who's running authorizations for disability leave and other things like that. So sometimes it gets into almost like a case manager piece. Now, we do have a psychiatrist on the line though here. So Dr. Pappas, <laughs> I'm gonna chime in here. <laughs> yeah, you know, um... When you, when you mentioned, Penny, that your client walked themselves into an inpatient unit, my heart opened up because that is somebody that was willing to take charge of their own life force and get the help that they needed. So kudos to them. And oftentimes we have the opposite response like oh no i'm not going to let anybody know if i go to the psychiatrist e even as an outpatient um i'm going to be labeled and painted forever and uh so that your client showed great courage in in doing that the second thing is i totally also uh identify with how how lonely it can feel as the coach oh i'm i i'm the only one that this person is uh confiding in and i don't feel enough in terms of my training experience wherewithal at the time to to be that lonely only but you, you shouldn't have to be because this idea of creating a team is huge when when i've had people come on the discovery calls with with the happy nd or in my private uh coach practice i that's often step one if they if they show that you know i'm coming after you know six traumas and something horrible just now happened in my practice and uh i'm getting ready to be fired or there's some malpractice suit and plus they have early on onset pain like not that we don't all but it, it's highlighted for them is, is what i'm saying and that uh having a consultation with a psychiatrist is often my <laughs> first encouragement to them and if there are old timey psychiatrists like me, I'm I'm kind of a dinosaur, but ones that do the combination of medicines as they are needed and actual 
psychotherapy when it when it is needed. But more and more, those roles are separate. So you have a therapist, you have a primary care doctor, maybe, and then you have a psychiatrist, hopefully, who has some sentience about uh, physician mental well-being and has some willingness to hear the the kinds of distress that that people have. What I was um, noticing is that a lot of physicians, for for varying reasons, push away from themselves these painful situations. Uh, in, in more um, psychiatric terms, that would be countertransference, where you take your responses that are germane to you, but then you put it onto something in the present and get confused between what's what there. But the idea is that uh, a lot of physicians, like like us, you know, can feel an aversion, like get this this complicated situation away from me. And um, another is there, but for the grace of God go I, and and it's 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 very anxiety provoking. And so if you happen to be a coach that's not also a psychiatrist, then you might feel like God, I don't have what it takes. But what I'm saying is. I'm stepping up as a psychiatrist as and as a coach, and I'm wanting that person to get a consultation at least and and then move forward with the kinds of treatment and therapy that they might need. And I've had at least four people come back to me that you know end up with um, and they're my client coaching clients as well as their need their needing to be in psychiatric treatment. They said, you know what? Pam, I would not have done that had you not really been firm about it. So it's not a weakness to bring in a team, is what I'm trying to say. Well, There's a lot of reasons we, you know, we think there's something wrong with us if we if we have to do that. Well, but and again, what you want to do. think about the boundaries in your coaching relationship. So this is going to be true for anybody who's a coach, but also has other qualifications. We're physicians and coaches in a coaching relationship with other physicians. So what's ending up happening is we have a boundary. I'm a coach in this situation. I'm not your doctor. Look, Listen to, to Pam. She's a coach in this situation, not their psychiatrist. So ideally, all you coaches, you've got a contract that says, I am not going to offer you any medical, legal, or financial advice. If I think you need those things, I will refer you out. So notice Pam is saying, she knows she's a psychiatrist, but she's saying, you need to go see a psychiatrist. It's not me. I'm your coach. Are you with me? So I think that uh, one of the big decisions when you get into a complicated case like this, and let's just mention uh, suicide, depression, these are complications of burnout. Burnout itself is not a mental illness. Are you with me? So you get into a complicated case of somebody's out on disability, or they have a psychiatrist and a therapist when you meet them or you get that for them, you turn into a case manager because everybody else is dealing with either the past or the present. And as a coach, we're looking out the windshield as to what do you want to happen going forward and how are we gonna get you to that reality that you're trying to create for yourself going forward. It's a legitimate role that's separate from medical providers and folks that are signing disability papers and things like that. So let me ask you all this. If I'm in the middle of a discovery session with somebody and they crack a, um, a dark humor joke about often themselves, and nowadays we do this on Zoom. We used to do it on telephones, right? <laughs> I've been around long enough there wasn't Zoom, right? You, you got to the point where you could feel sort of vibes through the phone. You could hear people's energy change through the phone. And sometimes I'll get to the point where I'll say time out. Hang on a second, Chuck. You know, you just said, shoot yourself in the head. And I, I think you meant it to be funny, but you know, I got the hairs on the back of my neck sticking up. So I got to ask you a couple of questions, right? I'll just go through mine. And, and I'm not a trained, you know, suicide prevention hotline person or a psychiatrist, but do you have a gun, Chuck? Where is it? Is it loaded? 
Have you ever thought about killing yourself? Like really not joking about it, but really doing it? Have you ever tried? Do you live by yourself? Are you drinking drugs, losing weight, losing sleep? Will you promise me that you'll get that gun out of the house tonight? Uh, will you promise me that you won't try to kill yourself without calling me first? And I don't mean just trying to call me. I mean, reaching me and talking to me first. And let's get you a psychiatrist. That's sort of the line that I pursue. And um, I've never had anybody fight me on it. Usually it's like there's, they seem to be relieved that I'm going into that amount of depth and concern. And um, so that's been my experience. And I've had to do that over the course of 13 years now, about half a dozen times. What's been your experience of actually stopping a discovery session and doing some screening for a person that you're concerned about? It's interesting. Um, some people have selected the discovery session with me because I am a psychiatrist. And then we have one other psychiatrist that's in our uh, coach group, but in their mind, they are gonna be able to cover two birds with one stone. <laughs> and I'm pretty quick to say, well, you know, uh, you're calling me as a coach and I do lay out like what I am gonna be responsible for and, and what is what other team members need to be involved. And I've asked all the quest, all those questions, but you know, in the back of my mind, it's also it gives your spidey sense some tingling because you don't know necessarily what they're going to do after they've had the conversation with you, and that's totally in their um, in their control. And so. For me, I have to really go deep and see, all right, so how, how much do I trust the, what kind of connection or alliance that we've been able to make so far? Do I believe what they're telling me? Oh, yeah, I'm going to take the gun and I'm going to have my neighbor hold on to it. Okay. Uh, what, what I've had happen is people kind of argue with me about, well, I don't really need to um, take these things seriously, but they just made that joke that you were talking about and say, you know, I, I, I just want to be really sure about how you're, how, how safe you're feeling right now. I mean, you, you told me a bunch of stuff that's been going on. It sounds painful as hell. And I, I have never had them not get honest with me. And and I've also never had any of the ones that, that I have had to gone, go there with them, like the kinds of questions you're talking about, uh, stop coaching. They may take, they may need to take a, a hiatus from it, but they come back. And what I also am, um, trying to communicate with them is that I have worked with plenty of people that needed to be in treatment for depression, anxiety, uh, substance abuse, whatever, and they're also working in coaching. So it doesn't mean, oh God, get get away from me because you had these these problems. But how? But how? What makes sense in terms of their holistic life and um, to do in in what order and and with whom? Yeah, I totally agree that I have a lot of clients who have at least a therapist. And some have the therapist and the psychiatrist, even the ones who are not suicidal. And I think it's a really nice little trifecta to have, you know, um, like, why not have a team, you know, to, to your point, Dr. Uh, you know, earlier, Pam, like, we should have a team. Why wouldn't you want a team? And I tend to, you know, maybe falsely or whatever, I tend to kind of feel better when I know that there is a team and it's not just me because it is less lonely. Um, and I sort of, the, the way I kind of, in my own mind, differentiate it is, you know, the, the, the deeper work is going to be done in therapy, you know, and, and we can sort of focus on, I, I almost feel like we're the, like you said before, Dyke, like we're looking forward, like we're the bastion of, of light, you know, like what can we do, you know, now that we've working, we're working through the depression, we're working through the grief, 
you know, what are some things we can do to take care of yourself? What are some things that we can do to honor, you know, your friend? And I feel like it does give them something to hold their, you know, to kind of hang on to instead of just sort of being lost in the sadness or the grief. Like there's concrete things that we're giving them. And I, I, I think that's why some people kind of still like to have a coach, even though they're in therapy. I mean, I don't know. I'm just speculating. Um, and for me, I don't know, I guess maybe I should ask these questions, but I tend to just kind of keep it simple. And, you know, if somebody makes this sort of gallows humor remark, um, I, I just usually ask like, you know, ha have you tried, you know, are you serious, you know, with that comment? Have you tried before? Are you actively thinking about it right now? in this moment on this call, um, <laughs> am I dialing 911? Um, and, and, and I have 988. Oh, right. 988. Um, and I, I haven't, I actually haven't gone into like, you know, do you have a gun? Are you sleeping? Okay. I've just kind of kept it broad level. Maybe, maybe Pam, to your point of like, do I want to go that deep on a discovery call? I need to obviously screen to make sure that they're safe. And I'm clearly going to make the referral to a psychiatrist or a therapist. But yeah, I mean, I, I just never know how deep to go as the coach. Well, and one of the things I tell people is you've probably never had a supportive relationship with a colleague, which is almost certainly true for doctors. We have competitive relationship with colleagues. We have things we keep from our colleagues because we don't ever want to show a sign of weakness or anything like that. So I think that a conversation where they know you're a doctor and a coach and you're listening and you're actually listening from a point of trying to understand rather than judging what's been going on. Well, like you said, my, my friend committed suicide and it's been hell and I've found myself and all of a sudden they're being seen, honored and comprehended. Um, I think that that is a revelation for many people. And um, I think that that is um, some sort of uh, call for call a uh, call for a reality check. I need to really tell somebody who would understand exactly how I'm feeling. And I think that you can go as far as you'd like, as long as there's not weirdness going on in the call, as long as you're feeling that channel, you're following that energy line. Um, I think that you can talk about pretty much anything you want and they'll relax into it. At least I found it to be that way. And sometimes on those calls, you know how it is, you go into the flow and it's like, there's words coming out of your mouth, but you aren't thinking about it. It's coming from someplace else through you. And um, so I, I let those kind of things go um, and go meaning flow, keep going. Um, and I think that one of the things that we offer as coaches is a positive vision of the future. Whereas without our input and the conversations they have with us planning for what it is they want to do, this is a major, tra this is a major transition for them. If they've run into a wall of suicide, there's going to be stuff needs to change when they go back to work, if they go back to work, how they go back to work, when they go back to work. So to have a positive vision of the future in a situation where you'd otherwise be wallowing on and feeling shame and guilt and blame and failure and what if they find out and all that kind of stuff. I think that it's vital that there be a coach in the mix. And with most psychiatrists these days being medication folks, you know, you need to have a psychiatrist and a therapist and a primary care doc and you. And I think that's a, a team makeup that makes a lot of sense to me and have used it a bunch of different times. You know, in, uh, in listening to the two of you, what comes to my mind is um, knowing when to ask the deeper questions. Any like what you were saying, and I'm palpating or feeling the 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 extent of the connection as mm -hmm. as I'm listening, and I know that you've had this this sense yourself when you're um, talking with somebody, but some some of the questions might need to get more detailed if you're feeling in some sense that the person is less reliable and feeling less um, engaged in their own welfare. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, they're, they're like like making a, a referral to a psychiatrist after the call. That's that's less hands on than oh, you're actively you've got a gun in your hand, or and you need to get more active as the coach. You got this person on the phone or on the Zoom, and you you don't refer them on, but you got to get a next person that's right there that can help you, which, and that, and that gets, that gets harder. It really does as a coach, but it, so the questions is, okay, so how actively involved do I need to be as the coach with this individual right now at the end of this call? And sometimes I don't always have an answer for that. I, I don't. And I've what I've done is is um, had um, virtual handshake agreements that they're going to take an action step afterwards, and they're going to contact me after they take that action step, or they're going to call their sister, and their sister's going to call me, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. something like no, I've that. Had, I, I've had them. Uh, okay, can 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 you put your spouse on the line? Right. You. It, are they home? Yes, they are. Okay. Can I, can, can they come in and we can have the three of us have a conversation here. Right. And then those kinds of plans can be made in a more bedrock fashion, I would say. And the other thing I'll, I'll, I'll say is that I, I'm a very kinesthetic person. So for instance, when I close my eyes and you tell me to imagine something, I don't see anything. I become it. I feel it. I know it's there. I just don't see it. And 20 or 30% of our population are non-visual imagers like me. So what I'll tell you is I often use my body in coaching sessions. So I let my, I, I speak about what I'm feeling in my body. Like when you said that, Chuck, I got a pain in my chest. What do you think that was about? Or the hair went up in the back of my neck. What do you think that was about? I'll put it out into the conversation. Did you notice that? Or was it just me? It's a, it's a line of questioning that's a little bit unusual, but it's an interesting how that will draw people forward with asking a question based upon something you're feeling in their body. Maybe they're feeling it too. It'll take them deeper. So play with that if you're somebody who gets physical sensations during your coaching sessions. Yeah, I certainly do, and and I'm I'm also remembering at least one uh, gentleman who had had a psychiatric hospitalization, and he asked me, he said, "Look, are you scared to work with me because I've had this happen?" And I said, "Listen, man, how many times do you think I've worked with physicians that have been through suicide feelings or attempts?" And he goes, "Well, I hadn't thought about it," and I said, "Well." hundreds and he goes oh so you so this so this is okay with you i said well no i'm <laughs> sorry you're in trouble but I, yes i can work with you and so it's it's humanizing and this experience that has been so foreign to them having to be in the inpatient unit but had it has a team to to work with on, on the deep the deep issues while i was working with him about just the issues that you were describing to like, okay, so what is it that you really want going forward so that you don't repeat the same pain and suffering and yuck of, of your life so that it can open up and feel better to you? Yeah, somebody who has significant suicidal ideation or an attempt, there's a significant transition in whatever piece of their life that was causing this. So I usually split it into pieces, right? So your job, your practice, your career, your life, there's something going on in here that needs to go through a transition and we help them get moving forward on something like that. Now, one of the things that we were talking about before we started recording too was you may need to help coach them through their colleagues' reaction to them coming back to work. Because as physicians, I would say it scares the crap out of us <laughs> When somebody commits suicide, but what if they, what if they attempted suicide and now here they are back on the ward or the wing or the service with us? Say a little bit more about what your experience has been, Pam. Walking through the door that first day, 
is a real big deal for them. But what I've seen more often, um, the person may be expecting, you know, to be shamed and humiliated or, you know, all of that. But the thing that I find more eerie is silence and people saying nothing. Oh, we haven't seen her for the last six months. Hey, here you are. Here's your shiploads of patients to take right. care of. And you're on call for the next three weeks in a row right. because right. you're making up for the call that we had. Uh, and, and nobody <laughs> ever actually speaking of hey, the reason why you were gone and we care about you, we missed you, and we're glad to have you back as a human being. That is sometimes missing. Just the basic human welcoming of a colleague that has returned. And and I think that is that, the the scary mirror, you know, that that episode may hold up for the colleagues to say, oh gosh, you know, I always go to lunch with them. Like, you know, how could that happen to him? It could happen to me. You know, I don't want it to rub off on me. But I will say that I've also had clients tell me the the other side of the coin, which is they interpreted people asking, oh, how are you? How are you feeling? Are you feeling better? They interpreted that as like, oh, they're trying to get the gossip. They're trying to like, you know, poke around, see if I'm still okay. You know, they're they're making fun of me by asking if I'm okay, you know? Um, so yeah, I've, 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 I've had the opposite happen where people were reaching out and then whether it's still the the shame and the, you know, the, the guilt that they feel themselves, they, they interpreted those questions as being very invasive and they didn't want to tell anybody anything, you know? So it's, I guess it can run the gamut. Well, I hear, I hear that end of it too, Penny. I, I think you're right. And for those for folks in that kind of a situation, I would guess that there are layers of trust that existed before the episode or the hospitalization or the leave of absence that um, need to be adhered to. Like, okay, so I so there's a closer crowd that know what what was going on and what led up to my hospitalization. Now, those, you have a different kind of conversation than the ones that you've never really interacted with. And they're calling the end. What are you? You know, and totally. They might be trying to get the gossip. Yeah. It's true. Well, and, and I think that there's a fundamental difference in how one feels when a colleague off site, unseen, kills themselves and they're not here anymore. That's one kind of a wake-up call for those who remain behind. And there's another one for, for instance, your client, Penny, put herself in an inpatient unit for suicidal ID, but now she's back. Tell us a little bit about, did she come back to that same team? Was she able to go back to work in that organization with those people? Yeah, they tried. Um, but I think, you know, to your point, like it is, it is a wake up call, right? To, to hit that nadir yourself, it it really does make you reevaluate, you know, what you're doing with your life. And um, for that client, they started to realize that, you know, that the going back would not be good for their continued, you know, well being. Doesn't surprise um, any of us, does it? No. <laughs> um. So yeah, so now we're sort of figuring out what those next steps are gonna are gonna be, um, and what that's gonna look like. So that's still an ongoing process. Well, and just a little leadership outtake here. So she lost a colleague to suicide, and they didn't replace that person. And then she went as an inpatient. Did their management team get somebody to cover the service while these two people were out? Probably not. And I just want to say again, management corner. Wow, the productivity on that wing went way up because up, they took two salaries out of the expense side of the ledger. So this is a, a little bit of an evil twist on management, not covering temporary losses of staffing. Short staffing is evil when it comes to trying to offer great patient care and to preserve the well-being of the people that are actually seeing patients today. So 
what I would hope if you're a, a leader listening to this is that somebody commits suicide or somebody goes out on inpatient psychiatry treatment, that you would do everything you possibly can to get a locums in there to cover the holes in the schedule as soon as possible and be out there commiserating with the team, letting them know that you understand what's going on. You're doing what you can to make it better. Because some of these crushing, crushing emotions and crushing workloads are, are avoidable. A lot of them are a lot of the time. Yeah, and it's not just it's not just about the psyche, the so-called psychiatric illness of the person that was on the leave, but your your medical director, CEO types need to really start asking questions. What's going on in this unit? And mm -hmm. what what about the workflow? What about the staffing? What about the collegiality? Um, is there is there uh, an environment of trust? And probably not. Right. You know, and for good reason, for, you know, on the front line versus the admin line. But that is that is a wake up call for the admin team, too. But oftentimes they just kind of it goes right over their heads yeah. or, they blame, or they blame it on the person. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Well, and, and and just one last thing, and then we'll we'll wrap a little bit of a bow around this. I had two times in in the year 2022, twice when leadership teams came to me to ask about our corporate services, helping build a corporate burnout prevention strategy. And I always start with, why me? Why are you talking to me? And why now? That's what I usually start with. And twice we had three or four people from the C-suite on the, on the Zoom frame like this, the Hollywood Squares. And... Um, they looked at each other and they hummed and hawed a little bit. And then they finally said, well, I think it was the third suicide. Three, twice, three. So they didn't oh. take action until the third one. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, you know, you may be shocked by that. If you've never heard that kind of a story before, unfortunately I'm not. Um, because that's when the, the the burden of attempting to continue to ignore it becomes too much because everyone's up in arms and the local newspapers are probably starting to write things and all that kind of stuff. So um, what I'm saying is that a close call is a close call should be a never event. A suicide should be a never event. And one of the reasons that things can get out of control is the lack of rounding and shadowing by leadership teams of the people that they're supervising. And I'll let, again, a little leadership point, because what we're talking about is a context in which this individual decides for whatever reason that suicide's a viable option. What can we do as a leader about the context in which it took place? Shadow and round on people enough that when they see you, they say, well, Dyke, what are you doing here? To what do we owe this unexpected pleasure? as opposed to the typical reaction the typical leader gets, which is if you show up unannounced, they're gonna look at their toes and say, oh shit, what did I do now? They know they're in trouble. Why do they know that? Because you trained them, because the only time you show up is when they're in trouble. And that's bad leadership. That's how things get out of hand and you're surprised by somebody quitting or surprised by somebody throwing something, or surprised by somebody who committed suicide or went out on depression or an inpatient admitted themselves walking through the door. So there's a lot of things in an employee physician setting that leadership can do to get early warnings, to create better environments, and to mitigate for the kind of stresses that cause suicide. So, well, you know, I hope that, it, you know, after we're, we're complete with this tying up of, of a bow, that we make arrangements to talk about what some people talk about with, with moral injury and moral distress, being put in situations to do a job but not given the resources to do so or, or being obstructed from doing the job that they know needs to be done for these patients. Because I think that that's a real fueler of distress and misery in our colleagues. <clears throat> Absolutely. And let me let's just define a successful resolution here of a, of a 
of a situation that a doctor's gotten themselves into. And Penny, I'm assuming you're still coaching this person. Yep. Mm -hmm. And they're still in the middle of the transition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what I would suggest is that a successful resolution is that, and I'm, I'm not going to say that it's this person's working back in the same ward or wing or service or anything like that, because we as coaches don't operate that way. But this person has had a chance to reevaluate what they really want, whether it's seeing patients or something else, and they're on a path to a brighter future and feeling good about what happened. And my experience too is a decade from now, this person typically will speak about this as thank God I admitted myself because it's made all the difference in the world. Because that's a story of successfully resolved burnout in my experience. The other thank God I would add, besides that she, you know, they went to the inpatient unit, but they decided to do a call with you, Penny, and to work with you because they sense <laughs> that you would stick with them and help them come to some kind of uh, upgrading of their of their life, whether it's patient care or not. Yeah, I mean, I am very honored um, and um, I'm very humbled, you know, and touched by the fact that they did reach out they let me know what was happening, you know, and that they were going to go in and they let me know as soon as they came out and, you know, um, so yeah, so I, I do feel very good about that. Um, so I, I, I hope to do them right. Yep. We're all light workers. Um, one of the things that I believe is also true is that no matter what this person does, when they eventually go back to some sort of vocational activity will be um helping and healing in some fashion it might not be as an employee inside a healthcare delivery organization but i'm sure that they will be involved in that has anybody got anything they want to do or say or ask to be complete for today right on so thank you very much very very much dr pam pappas dr penelope shu uh, for your first person's pers perspective on part one uh, for working us through how to how to be a good ally and a support in part two. And now what it's like to work as a coach with somebody who's suicidal here in part three. And um, I hope that if you've listened through, dear listener, if you've listened through all three, that you've gotten some good um, experience and some good tips and some good insight out of this three-part series on physician suicide. And for now, that's it. Dyke Drummond at thehappymd.com in beautiful Seattle, Washington with the latest edition of the Physicians on Purpose podcast. Until we're together again at some point in the very near future, keep breathing and have a great rest of your day.